Good evening. Uh, thank you, James, for having me here tonight. Um, here to spend a little bit of time talking to you about um, myself. I'll give you a little bit of a history of, of who I am, and then I will talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, James had asked me to touch on tonight. So starting off, let me introduce myself. My name is Fred Bryan, and um, I am a lifelong uh, Minneapolis resident up to about a year or so ago when uh, my wife and I we moved from South Minneapolis and uh, went out to the Bloomington. But prior to that, I lived in South Minneapolis my whole life. A uh, graduate of Minneapolis Central, uh, class of 79. You can't see them, but we've got a couple other Central graduates here in, in the room with us. And from uh, Central, I went to uh, college at the University of Northern Iowa down in, down in Cedar Falls, Iowa. <clears throat> uh, when I went down to University of Northern Iowa, I got my Bachelor of Arts degree in Social Work and a minor in Corrections. And then from there, I began working in Corrections shortly after I graduated. But actually, my career in Corrections uh, started in the uh, uh, winter of, of 1978. I did have a 34 year career as an employee, uh, but my senior year, um, I won't say like a lot of seniors, but like some seniors, I hadn't quite figured out uh, what path I wanted to go on. So I was, so I was still making some poor decisions uh, my senior year in high school. And I'll throw this picture up here. Some of you may recognize that look with the, uh, with the old school uh, fro, but uh, that's my senior picture. But that's also pretty much how I looked like the night in the winter of 1978 that I got arrested by the Minneapolis police. And me and some buddies <clears throat> were riding around in a stolen car. And uh, our thought was, is, is we was out partying and uh, we ran out of beer. And our thought was is that we were going to uh, take the stolen car and drive over to Wisconsin and get some more beer. So imagine, already had some, had a few, um, steal a car, get intoxicated, go drive over to Wisconsin to get some more. <clears throat> Not very good decisions, obviously, but we didn't get very far. Uh, we got arrested uh, before we even got out of Minneapolis, and uh, probably the best thing that happened to me at, at that point uh, in my life was, was to get arrested. And uh, got taken off the streets that night, went down to the juvenile detention center, um, called my mom to come get me. She basically said, well, you know, you got yourself in there, you can get yourself out. Um, was able to uh, get a ride home, ended up going through the court system, and I ended up getting sent to a place called the Hennepin County Home School. <clears throat> uh, back then it was called Glen Lake. Uh, the Hennepin County Home School is, is still in existence. It's Hennepin County's juvenile residential facility. And I was sent out there. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it was just for a short period of time, but uh, when I was out there, I had an interaction with a staff where I felt the staff was being uh, disrespectful to me. And as a result of that uh, interaction, I had some program consequences that I had to deal with. And one of them was I had to go speak to a supervisor. And as I was talking to that supervisor, I was being a typical 17-year-old and just wasn't listening. And... Uh, you know, just coming up with the yeah buts all the time. He would say something, I'd say yeah buts, and, and he'd say something else, and I'd say yeah but again, and, and you know, it was all about, you know, I felt I'd been disrespected. Um, finally, at one point in the conversation, the supervisor said, well, look, if you think you can do this better, then uh, when you get out of here, finish high school, uh, go to college, get your degree, come back here and apply, and I'll, and I'll give you a job. Now, when he said that, I could have took that as, as another adult just kind of blowing me off and, and kind of patronizing me and, and just trying to send me on my way so, so, I, so I'd uh, quit all the yeah buts. Or I could take it as, as a challenge, you know, him throwing down the gauntlet and, and me um, uh, rising to that challenge. And fortunately, I, I did the latter. I, I took it as a challenge. I finished my uh, short time at the Hennepin County Home School, went back, graduated from Minneapolis Central. As I stated earlier, I went down to the University of Northern Iowa, got my degree in social work with a minor in corrections, and shortly after I graduated, I applied with Hennepin County. And I ended up getting hired out at the Hennepin County Home School as a uh, juvenile correctional, back then we were called juvenile correctional workers. And uh, 
so about four years after I was in the Hennepin County Home School, four and a half maybe, um, I was actually employed out there working. And I was actually working with some of the staff that were there when I was when I was a resident. So so that was that was kind of interesting. But that uh, short stint out at Hennepin County Home School, as I say now, uh, actually started my uh, career in corrections with Hennepin County. And, and fortunately, it, it ended up being a little bit more positive. Um, <clears throat> I worked out at the Hennepin County Home School for about five years. Then I left there, went downtown, uh, got into probation. And then I just kind of kind of worked my way up in, in the system and, and eventually ended up in, in management. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get more into the uh, into my talk here. But what I also want to talk about is um, <clears throat> as I was growing up, football was was a real important part of my life. And uh, here's a picture of me in college, uh, my senior year. <coughs> <laughs> didn't quite have as have, have as large of a throw as it got to the point it was, it was too hard to take care of. Um, but I played football down at University of Northern Iowa. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship down there. And I, and I uh, played uh, defensive tackle, uh, defensive end uh, when I was down there and, and, and enjoyed it. Had a couple injuries, but, but nothing major. Uh, but it was an opportunity for me to get my education, uh, having somebody else pay for it with, with a full scholarship. So I took full advantage of it, and, and like I said, uh, was able to um, <clears throat> uh, graduate and get hired at the uh, Hennepin County Home School. Another way that football became important in my life was when I get, got back from the University of Northern Iowa, I wanted to stay involved in football somehow. Uh, so what I did was I started coaching over at North High with uh, Coach Richard Robertson, uh, Robinson, who was my coach uh, when I was in high school. And uh, I can't remember how we made the connection, uh, but I started coaching uh, over there at North High, and uh, he allowed me, uh, with another um, uh, Minneapolis Central grad, to coach the uh, sophomore and the JV team, and then we'd obviously help out on Fridays with the varsity team. So I was doing that for, uh, for a couple years, and I considered uh, Coach Robinson a mentor of mine, uh, and uh, he did a good job not only teaching me about coaching, but also teaching me about uh, other aspects of life. But he also uh, was, was a real, to the point, honest man. And uh, he came to me one day and said something that was probably, you know, in a sense, life-changing for me because it put me on a, on a different track in regards to football. Because I think he came to realize that I wasn't a very good football coach. Uh, and, I, and I came to realize it too, so he came to me one day and he said, uh, Fred, you ever consider uh, doing some football officiating? And uh, I kind of took that as a uh, uh, kind of a uh, subtle clue that maybe it was time for me to consider something else besides coaching. And so uh, I told him, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in that. And he uh, connected me with the Minneapolis athletic uh, director at that time, Bill, Bill McMore. And, uh, he made some connections for me, and, and, and some other people made some connections for me, so I started officiating football. So I started out officiating uh, high school football, junior varsity, got on a varsity crew, and then made some more connections and started officiating uh, junior college, <clears throat> made some more connections, started officiating Division three, uh, made a few more connections, uh, started officiating arena football, and and I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, when I was doing a Division Three game over at St. Thomas, uh, there happened to be an NFL officiating scout in, in, the, uh, in the audience. Uh, the Vikings were playing the next day on a Sunday. This game was on a Saturday that I was doing, and this scout happened to observe me. And uh, the next Monday after the, the Sunday game, and, and he had left and went back home, he sent me an email and said that he would saw me on that Saturday. And, uh, asked me if I was interested in uh, filling out an application for the NFL. He said, no guarantees, you know, you have to uh, uh, do, some, do some work, you know, it's not like we're going to hire you tomorrow, but we can get you in the pipeline, so to speak, uh, if, if you're interested. And I thought about it for about maybe two seconds and said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll apply for the NFL. <laughs> you know, you got, got nothing to lose. So uh, I, I put in the application, uh, did some arena uh, football, I went over to Europe and did a couple years of NFL Europe, uh, then went uh, 
when I had an opportunity to work in the Big Ten. I worked in the Big Ten for a total of about uh, five years, and three of those years were was full time on on a step on a, a regular crew. And then in 2009, I got invited to, uh, to go into the NFL, and I've been in the NFL since 2009, <clears throat> and I've uh, been working uh, games in the NFL as an umpire since then. And uh, I've had, had some success uh, in the NFL and was fortunate enough uh, to work the uh, Super Bowl 53 that was down in Atlanta. Uh, Tom Brady's uh, last Super Bowl win, he may, he may get another, but that was the last one that uh, Tom Brady had when they beat the uh, Los Angeles Rams. So I've been fortunate uh, in that aspect, and going back to what I said earlier with uh, uh, my mentor, Richard Robinson, uh, he's the one that, that started me along that path. Uh, so that's one thing you may be able to take out of this, this talk, is that uh, make sure that uh, if you have mentors and they give you some advice to, to take it to heart and, and move forward uh, with the advice that they give you. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> As I stated, James asked me to talk about a, a, a couple things. Well, when he asked me to talk, I, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he gave me some suggestions. So I've got about four more slides that I'm, that I'm going to show and, and talk a little bit about and then uh, should, should be finished at that point, and, and I know with this format, um, you may not be able to get any questions, but if, but if the two of you that are here have any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to answer them. But one of the things that uh, <clears throat> James asked me to talk about was preparing for success. Um, <clears throat> when I think about preparing for success, not, I not only think about some of the things that I've been able to do, but uh, I think about some of the things that other people have been very successful in, in doing, or have been successful people, and, and, and how do they prepare for success. And one of the people that I came across recently when I was uh, just surfing the internet, um, you know, can't even remember what I, what I was looking for or why I was on the internet, maybe it was just on my phone, but I came across this uh, individual called, called Johnny Kim. And I'm going to put up here a quote from Johnny, Johnny Kim <clears throat> that uh, it states, I'm not gifted, I'm not smarter than everybody else, I'm not stronger, I just have the ability to stick to a plan and not quit. Now if you look at this picture, you can tell that uh, Johnny Kim is a jack of all trades here. Uh, he's a Navy SEAL, he's a doctor, and he's also an astronaut. So you can imagine the amount of success uh, he's had in his life uh, at, at what I think is a fairly uh, young age. And, and how did he get there? He uh, indicated that he had a plan. And he had a plan uh, that he, he put together and he stuck to it. And by sticking to that plan, he's able to accomplish what a lot of people, one of those things would be an awesome accomplishment, but he's, he's accomplished three of those things. <clears throat> And just to talk a little bit more about plans is, in my experience, uh, plans evolve. Uh, when, we, when we look at Johnny Kim here, uh, maybe he started out with his plan to be a uh, Navy SEAL, and then at some point his plan evolved into becoming a doctor and eventually evolved into becoming an a, uh, a, uh, astronaut. So just remember that your plans can evolve, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can start out, like when I started with Hennepin County, my plan was to work for Hennepin County for about five years and then see, see what other opportunities came up. Um, that five years, as I already stated, turned into 34 years. And uh, my plan, plan evolved throughout my uh, career with, with Hennepin County. So it's not like I'm saying find a plan and, and you can't alter it or it can't evolve or it can't change, uh, but st stick with the, the uh, base or the foundation of your plan and, and stick with it and, and, and it'll help you be successful in your life. <clears throat> also with officiating, uh, my original plan was to just officiate high school football. I really didn't have any aspirations beyond that. But then when I got that email from the uh, NFL scout and he indicated that he thought I had an aptitude and some skill for this, my plan changed. And uh, the basic plan was to officiate football, uh, but the change in my plan was to was try to move forward and, and, and advance as far as I could. 
The other thing that uh, <clears throat> James uh, asked me to talk about, or one of the things that he asked me to talk about was, was overcoming obstacles. Now, when you look at this picture, I'll admit it's more of a picture of Cam Newton overcoming an obstacle, which was me rather than me overcoming an obstacle. Um, but that is a picture that was taken down in the New Orleans uh, Superdome a couple years ago. And it was one of those plays where Cam Newton uh, ran a quarterback draw and I was standing there right in the middle and, and, and we kind of met in the middle. And, and you, if you think he looks big on TV, he's, he's big in person. And uh, uh, I didn't stay an obstacle very long. He uh, pushed me aside very quickly and, and moved on uh, <clears throat> to what he wanted to do. But when we talk about uh, overcoming obstacles, one of the things I think is very important is that you need to be flexible and adaptable when obstacles uh, come, in, come into your way. You have a plan and you plan, all of a sudden you hit an obstacle when, you, when you're trying to uh, implement your plan. Uh, it has some flexibility and it has some adaptability. Um, when I was working for Hennepin County, like I said, I started out as a supervisor, or excuse me, as a juvenile correctional worker, and then I had some flexibility and some adaptability to move into being a supervisor. And one of the things that I had to adapt to when I was a supervisor is, is getting better at uh, conflict resolution, uh, dealing with people that are that are button heads, uh, dealing with uh, opposing opinions, uh, opposing issues. And so I had to adapt to be able to uh, be successful uh, in my continuing plan of, of working with Henry County. And also with, with my officiating career, uh, I started out as an umpire and I had been an umpire uh, leading all the way up uh, to getting to the Big Ten. But when the Big Ten called me, they called me and said, Fred, we'd like to bring you in, but we don't have any room for umpires. We, we've got enough umpires. Uh, would you consider coming in as a line judge? And a line judge is somebody that watches the line of scrimmage. And I had very little experience as a line judge and very little experience watching the line of scrimmage. Uh, but you know what? I, I said, I'm not going to let this obstacle uh, alter my plan. And, and, and I figured it out. I said, yeah, I'll come in as a line judge. And I uh, went and talked to other line judges, studied film, uh, went to uh, games and, and watched the line judges. Got into the rule book and, and made sure I understand the rules that line judges have to have to understand, and, and was able to overcome that obstacle uh, in regards to uh, my officiating plan. <clears throat> Another thing I'll talk a little bit about is, is dealing with negativity. That was on the list that uh, James sent me. And when you look at this picture, I can tell you there's a whole lot of negativity coming out of that man's mouth <laughs> when he's talking to me. <laughs> and uh, uh, he wasn't saying nice things uh, at, at this point. Uh, and just, just a little history behind this picture. Uh, <clears throat> that is uh, Gus Bradley, and he's actually a Minnesota native. I believe he's down from the Pipestone uh, uh, area. And at this time, he was the uh, head coach of the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. And they were playing the Chicago Bears. And Chicago was on offense, and they ran a play, and they fumbled the ball, and there was a big pileup. And I went in there looking for the ball, and I saw that Chicago had the ball, so they recovered their own fumble. But unfortunately, in my excitement, I come out, and I pointed the, the wrong way. And I pointed and made it look like Jag the Jacksonville Jaguars had recovered the fumble. And uh, one of my uh, officiating crewmates came up to me and said, Fred, Fred, slow down, slow down. Chicago got the ball. And I said, you're right, you're right. And I turned around and, and pointed the right way. But the next time I went over to the sideline, um, Coach Bradley was, was none too happy with me. And it's kind of, kind of interesting because before the game, we, we kind of talked and, and kind of connected a little bit of, of, about the Minnesota thing. Uh, but he forgot all about that when, uh, when uh, he thought he had, ball, had the ball, and, and in fact, he didn't. <clears throat> but <clears throat> one of the things I've noticed in, in my career, both professionally and um, uh, on the football field, is that change often brings negativity. Uh, when you have to make a change uh, within yourself, maybe there's something with your plan that you got to change. There's a change at your job. Uh, there's a change uh, with a relationship. Uh, there's, a, there's a change with uh, just, just any kind of change that may happen. 
oftentimes that brings, brings negativity. And when that happens, what I think is, is what you need to do is just kind of get back to your basics and get back to your, get back to your fundamentals. And uh, just try to slow things down a little bit so you can understand why the change is happening and understand any of the negativity that might be associated with that change. Uh, and try, try to keep things simple for a while and, until you can get yourself in a position where you can continue to move forward and continue uh, uh, to do positive things rather than be overcome come with the negativity. And uh, one of the things when I was working for Hennepin County, uh, when things would, would get negative, especially around change, one of the fundamentals I would ask is, is what we doing now, the change we make it, is it good for our clients? And if it isn't good for our clients, then, then we should be making this change. But if it is good for our clients, let's continue with the change process, let's continue to move forward, and let's continue uh, uh, to make this change a positive thing rather than, than trying to focus on the negative things. And then with football officiating, um, I'll be the first one to tell you, and just about every other football official I know would tell you that we make mistakes. Uh, it's, it's just part of the game. And as that picture shows, when we make mistakes, uh, the negativity comes out pretty quick uh, by the players, by the coaches, by the fans. And uh, it's easy to get caught in that and continue to focus on the mistakes that you made on the football field. But how I get out of that is, once again, I go back to, the, to my fundamentals. Uh, who are my primary keys as an umpire? My primary keys as an umpire are the center and two guards before the ball is snapped. And after the ball is snapped, it's the left guard, left tackle, and sometimes the left tight end if, if there's a tight end out there. So I just go back to those basics and those fundamentals and say, you know, I'm really going to focus on who my keys are and block out all that negativity. Yeah, I made a mistake, but I'm going to move forward. And the worst thing on the football field is if you make one mistake, don't, don't make another. So, <clears throat> honest work. <coughs> I'm going to put a quote up here, and the quote is, how you do anything is how you do everything. And that quote came from uh, an individual that uh, I've never met, uh, but he's, a, he's the grandfather of a good friend of mine, a good friend of mine named uh, Brad Freeman, and his grandpa, Grandpa Freeman, had this, had this quote. And the quote is, is based on an interaction way back when, when Brad was about nine years old, he lives in Oxboro, uh, Mississippi. And his grandfather gave him a chore. And the chore was to uh, uh, weed the weed the garden. Uh, and according to Brad, it was a, it was a large garden, and he didn't really want to do it. And uh, so, as any nine year old would do that doesn't want to do something, he kind of kind of half assed it and, and just did, just didn't do the work. Uh, and when his grandfather came back and, and saw that what he had done, uh, Brad said he knew right away that his grand. Uh, grandfather was disappointed in him because uh, he had half-assed it and, and didn't do the job that his grandfather expected. And this is when his grandfather sat him down and said, Brad, <clears throat> how you do anything is how you do everything. And the point of that is, is how you do even the smallest tasks, the anything kind of tasks, uh, reflects on, on how you're going to do the bigger tasks, the more important thing. Um, so put the energy and effort into doing the bigger things excuse me, the smaller things, the same kind of effort you would do uh, uh, doing the bigger things. And uh, that's going to help you get to a point in your life, I think, where you're, you're, you're going to be able to continue being successful. And uh, I believe this is <clears throat> my last slide. Um, but uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, is improving yourself. <clears throat> and this is this, this last uh, phrase or quote here is something that I, I try to focus on quite a bit and, and, and what it says is, is make someone proud today and um, what that means to me is that if you need some extra motivation uh, to do something if, if you need that extra little push to do something think about who's going to be proud of you when, when, when you accomplish whatever it is is, is you're working on could be my mom, could be my brother and sister, could be my wife and kids, it could be one of my mentors, uh, it, it could be uh, the people, when I was working, the people that I supervised, 
Uh, it could be just about anybody that's involved in your life. But uh, think about who you're going to make proud uh, that day. And that's something that I try to think about it every Sunday and occasionally on Monday and occasionally on Thursday when I go out to the football field. It's something that I try to tell myself before I go out on the football field. Who am I going to make proud today? Who am I going to uh, uh, go out there and, and do such a good job that if they're watching this game, uh, that they're going to say, I'm proud of, of Fred because of, because of the work he did today. So, thanks for the time. Appreciate you uh, inviting me out here. And uh, that's all I have for you this evening. Thank you. <clears throat>